All right. Well, thank you everyone for your support and your curiosity and turning out here tonight. Um, I'm so glad to hear you guys are interested in my research. Um, um, and for those of you who I spoke to, just really wonderful um, being able to hear your stories and uh, incorporate that into uh, the research. It really helped to bring a lot of these numbers into focus and uh, remind us what we are uh, really fighting for here. So I will share my presentation screen. Um, everybody see it? Good? All right, so we can jump in. Um, so as a lot of you know, I did some research over the summer on uh, the impacts of the Green Line on housing stability in uh, Somerville, um, really looking at what the current situation is, um, where it might be going, um, and how we can try to do something different. So we're gonna have three stops on our, on our train today. Um, we're gonna start by going over some of the current conditions of housing. Um, we're going to look at some of the projected changes um, that I was able to calculate um, for what uh, changes might happen to rent prices and property values. Um, and we're gonna look at some strategies uh, for how to avoid those uh, projected conditions. Um, and throughout this presentation, I'm going to try to keep uh, the jargon and kind of technical terms that I use as low as possible. Um, but there is one term that I think is useful um, for folks to know, and that is the idea of the walk shed. So the walk shed is an area that you can reach uh, in a certain distance or time from a point of interest, in this case, T-stops. When I reference the GLX walk shed, I'll mean the area you can reach in a 10 minute walk to or from the new Green Line stops. Sometimes I'll refer to a station walk shed, for example, the Union Square walk shed, or the entire GLX walk shed, meaning all six new stops in Somerville. 90% of Somerville is going to be within a 10 minute walk of a Green Line stop. Um, that other 10% is pretty well covered by uh, the red line, the orange line, and the 20 minute walk sheds from all of the, the transit in, in the city. So this is gonna be a big change for transit access uh, in Somerville and is also important to keep in mind when we think about um, what housing is in and outside of the walk shed. Uh, the other term that I want to bring up here, um, because I'll be referencing it a lot, is uh, the idea of affordability. So the US Department of Housing and Urban Development has a metric of affordability when it comes to housing that is 30% of your monthly income. Um, and that's determined in part by household size um, and financial income. Uh, it doesn't take into consideration some other expenses that you might have um, that might make afford um, paying for rent and housing more difficult, such as childcare or um, medical expenses. But uh, when I talk about affordability, um, I mean 30% of monthly income. So we'll start off by looking at uh, what housing uh, conditions exist in Somerville right now. Um, and as we know, rents are expensive. They're about $400 too expensive for most low-income families in Somerville. Um, this chart here shows uh, all of the apartments that I looked at uh, in the various station walk sheds. Um, and each little dot on there corresponds to an apartment. So the bigger the dot, uh, the more apartment or the more bedrooms are in there. So bigger dots, more family size. The, the red dotted line is the halfway point in the prices of these uh, uh, apartment price ranges. Um, so 50% of apartment prices fall to the left of that line and the other 50 to the right. And that blue line is where uh, HUD says an apartment is affordable when you look at the price per bedroom. So less than 50% of apartments in each of the GLX walk sheds are affordable to a low-income family. Uh, 
And these are all listings that have come up in June or January since 2019. Because we already know that this is an expensive baseline, uh, as prices are likely to increase, it's going to become harder for families who are looking for affordable housing. And one of the key things that came out of the conversations that I had um, with our tenant leaders uh, was where people look to find affordable housing. Um, the listings that I used were all from uh, apartment sites such as PadMapper or Apartments.com, um, and those tend to be a little uh, more expensive. There are some other ways that folks can find affordable apartments, and those might be through more informal online listings such as Facebook and Craigslist, although research has found that in cities around the country, these informal online listings overrepresent richer, whiter, and more educated census tracts. Um, so in some other areas, uh, there might be fewer apartments uh, available to, to rent. But the big thing that came out of a lot of my conversations with the tenant leaders was that they found their apartments through family and friend networks. And these are so crucial. They've uh, been able to remain housed and afford their apartments for the most part um because of existing networks but as more people become displaced from the city those networks are going to thin um, and it'll become more difficult um, for folks who are looking for housing if they have poor credit or perhaps don't have residency status um, or have employment other than a stable nine to five job uh, where a landlord might discriminate against them for uh, renting the apartment And these thinning community rental networks are exacerbated by anonymous LLC uh, owners. So Somerville has $14 billion worth of residential property across the entire city. And hundreds of LLCs uh, own $2 billion of that $14 billion. This graph here shows the top 20 uh, LLCs by the amount of property that they own. Um, and that's nearly a third of all the property owned by LLCs in the city. So that's $600 million of property in Somerville owned by small anonymous corporations. If you look carefully at this list, you'll see that some are obviously divisions of one person or a uh, group's properties. Um, and this ownership structure makes it harder for tenants to build relationships with landlords that facilitates negotiation over rent and repairs uh, and makes it harder to understand who owns Somerville's housing stock. But you can also see who is likely not purchasing homes in Somerville, and that is moderate income families. Current property values in Somerville um, from the assessor's database. So this is before properties even go on the market and are subject to bidding um, and influence from realtors driving up the price. Um, so current property values are too expensive for a family making even the area median income, which is $120,000 a year. Even buying a condo at a standard 30-year mortgage is unaffordable for that hypothetical family. This means that only high income earners and investors are going to be able to purchase properties in Somerville and set the rents in multifamily homes. And I'll point out on this chart that shows uh, some of the different residential styles uh, or housing types in Somerville um, is that the difference between uh, values in the GLX walkshed versus outside of the walkshed uh, is pretty minimal. The GLX walkshed is currently uh, slightly less uh, valuable, but we can probably expect those gaps to start to close as uh, the green line comes in um, and, and values increase. And part of this has to do with the land value. So this is a map of every property in Somerville, and it's comparing the value of the land to the value of the building that's sitting on it. 
the more orange you see, the higher the land value. The more blue, the higher the building value. Brown means that both the land and the building are high for Somerville, while pale orange means that the building and the land are less value valuable than most property in Somerville. <laughs> yes, sure. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Will do. Uh, so this is a map of every property in Somerville. Uh, it compares the value of the land to the value of the building that is sitting on it. The more orange you see, the higher the land value. The more blue, the higher the building value. Brown is going to mean that both the land and the building are highly valued in Somerville, while pale orange means that both the building and the land are less valuable than most property in Somerville. So if you look over in West Somerville, you see a lot of orange, a lot of brown. Um, and this is an area where the red line has already been, properties have historically always been uh, more valuable in this part of the city. And as we move west or east, we start to see more light orange, more blue. Um, and this is where the land value is currently less. This is also mostly in the outline of our green line walk shed. So we can expect property values to increase through the value of the land in the DLX walk shed. One more uh, piece of condition of uh, Somerville in the walk shed today um, is the status of our affordable housing inventory. So these, this is a map of all the subsidized apartment buildings in Somerville, um, all the ones that are deed restricted to be affordable to uh, low income families. And hey, Zoe. Yeah. Can we take a sec to unpack what that means um, when a, a property is subsidized and um, deed restricted? Yes. So uh, each of the dots that you're seeing here are housing complexes or buildings in Somerville um, that have received funding from various sources. It might be um, the city or the state or the federal government through a number of different funding programs. Um, and through those subsidies, those rents are held at an affordable rate um, according to the, and it's deed restricted because it's written in the, um, the document that is the, the legal representation of that building. Um, but a lot of these deed restrictions have expiration dates. Uh, and a number of the expiring uh, deeds are right in the middle of the Green Line walk shed, almost right on top of the stations that are coming in. Uh, it's also worth pointing out that our larger affordable housing complexes are outside of the 10 minute walk shed. Um, they're, you know, in the 15 to 20 minute range, but uh, they're not quite as close as some of the other ones. And those are the ones that are preserved in perpetuity. So until the end of time, uh, they should be affordable. So that was Somerville today. Now we're going to look at how Somerville might look if we do nothing, if we just let the green line come in um, and don't make any sorts of changes. And rents are going to increase. Uh, the average increase to rent is going to be uh, about 200 to $500. And this is an average increase. So it's not going to be every single apartment is going to go up by this amount. But uh, when you take the average increases for all the rent increases across the city, some might be more, some might be less the average increase is going to be between 200 and 500. And it's going to vary a little bit depending on uh, 
the the area of Somerville that it is. Um, some are likely to see much, or some are more likely to see higher increases. So if you see the, the lighter orange section, those are higher minimum increases on average uh, versus the darker orange. Overall, most departments are probably going to see something like a 12 to 25% monthly increase from that median apartment rent. And many tenants are already seeing these increases before the green line even opens. Uh, a lot of the conversations that I had, uh, landlords would say that they were raising rents um, for property taxes, which are tied to raising property values. The thing is, though, rent is likely to increase more than property taxes. The average increase to an annual property tax bill for a residential property uh, is going to be about $1,000 to $1,500 annually. Uh, so this comes out to about 83 to 125 monthly. And we can work through kind of an example of what this might look like. So we could take the median triple decker in Union Square uh, is worth about $1.1 million. Its tax bill today uh, is about $11,000. And we can imagine that it's going to increase by $1,000 to $12,000 per year. In response, uh, we'll say the median triple decker has the median rent for a three bedroom in Union Square, which is $3,200 a month. And we'll say the landlord increases at $400, uh, well within the range for Union Square's projected rent increases. Across those three apartments in that triple decker, uh, the rental income increase alone is going to be $14,000 and $400. Um, and that's more than enough to cover the annual tax bill just from the rent increases. So this is, again, a projection, an idea of what might happen in Somerville if we do absolutely nothing to change the tide, change the track. So next, I'm going to present some strategies that uh, might help us uh, address these insecurities and move towards uh, a brighter future. And I'm going to talk about three different things. Um, one are policy solutions that are going to increase the responsibility of landlords and the rights of tenants. Uh, another that separates the value of the land from the value of the housing. And another that starts to get at some of these uh, LLC property investors by increasing the taxes on them. So we know that the greatest policy to prevent excessive rent increases is rent control. This, as we all know, uh, will require action at the state level that lets Somerville set its rules. Landlords will be limited in their ability to maximize profits because they'll be limited in their ability uh, to raise rents. Some might argue that rent control raises housing costs uh, in the long term. This is a, an economist view uh, because it makes the housing development too costly, i.e. they can't make as much money off their buildings. Uh, and this drives housing developers out of the market. However, another recent study on the New York Second Avenue subway, um, which much like the Green Line extension, uh, was a long awaited uh, improvement to transit access in the Lower East Side of New York, uh, found that increasing transit access actually reduces the cost of housing development in those neighborhoods because financing those projects gets easier. Another policy that would make a big difference is the right of first refusal, um, which would allow tenants to organize when a building is going up for sale to actually even be able to block the sale of that building and buy it themselves. Um, either uh, as co-owners or with uh, the help of a nonprofit. Um, and this prevents uh, housing from getting um, put into the hands of an investor and stay in a in community ownership. 
But the strength of these policies and their eventual enforcement will depend on the ability of tenants to organize and hold landlords accountable. Uh, this way they can resist displacement. Until we are able um, to enact these policies at the state and local level, building a strong base of tenant power and solidarity will be crucial in their absence and for their eventual efficacy. Another uh, intervention we can consider is expanding the community land trust. Um, and the I basic idea of this is it's housing that's not used for investment, just housing. So just yesterday, the Somerville Community Land Trust did a ribbon cutting for this $3.7 million development. Um, and they're going to sell the five condos through a lottery uh, to households that are making 100% area median income, which is that $120,000 a year. And the value on these condos are going to stay capped at 2%. And the idea of this is that the, the benefits of the nearby amenities um, are for the residents and not the land value. So when the green line comes in, that's a good news for people who live there um, and not for the value of the property. This way, the housing stays affordable for the next generation of residents who might be looking to buy, and people won't get priced out of their housing as they age or experience changes in income. This is not home ownership for wealth production, but it is home ownership for housing stability. Uh, and it's also an opportunity for the city of Somerville to get directly involved in the affordable housing crisis because it will be able to support the community land trust through funds as it did for the purchase of this building um, and fund its, its growth and further acquisition of more housing in the city. Uh, and the third and final piece that I'll talk about tonight is uh, tax changes and LLC oversight. So Massachusetts does not have a separate profit tax for LLCs like other states do. Um, California, for example, will tax profits uh, from LLCs ranging from $900 to $11,000, depending on how much they make. Um, so right now, LLC owners in Massachusetts get some big advantages of being able to run their rental properties like a business. Um, they can do deductions and write-offs because it's their business. They can even classify as a corporation and pay a lower tax rate of about 23% instead of whatever their personal income bracket is, which would almost certainly be more. Um, and so this is a this is a real gap in how we regulate uh, our housing market. So as we go forward, um, I know from the the strength of this room and uh, the power that people are building together that we're not going to settle for displacement and gentrification in Somerville. Uh, if the residents of Somerville remain united in ensuring that Somerville remains a community for everyone, um, where renters are equal as community members, as homeowners, we have a chance to make a future without displacement and gentrification reality. And thank you for watching. <laughs>